because I had already gone through so much with my parents and moving to Israel and moving to Chicago. I was not intimidated. is part of a series I've been running on former students of the 1992 Nobel Prize winner, Gary Becker, that I call Becker Students. So with the professor of economics at San Diego State University, Dr. Shoshana Grossbard, I've been a longtime admirer of Shoshana because of her work on the family and the economics of the household. She's written about a range of topics in that space, as well as in, has edited a journal called Review of Economics of the Household for many years. We talked before, but never quite like this. It's an interview I'm going to remember for a very long time. Dr. Grossbard begins the interview sharing about her family. She grew up in the shadow of the Holocaust with several immediate family members who were killed in Auschwitz death camps, as well as her father, who very nearly was. She shares her time in Israel as a young person and her first encounter with economists at Hebrew University. The interview naturally evolved to discuss her time at Chicago, where she met and took classes from Gary Becker, as well as Milton Friedman and many others. This is probably the most candid interview I've done, though. Shoshana shares a great deal about her disappointments in life and around uh, being an economist. And I will just say that and let you hear the rest from her. It was a real honor that she would open up with me the way she did. I felt very fortunate to be present for all of it. I'm teaching a course on the history of economic thought, and after we finished, I realized that stories like Shoshana's are never included in the history of economic thought. They're the kinds of stories that never get told, and they don't even appear in the footnotes. I think Shoshana's candid honesty about how she responded to the disappointments of her career are really thought-provoking, and I hope that you will listen with uh, listen with an open mind and an open heart. I'm Scott Cunningham, and this is The Mixtape with Scott. Okay, well, it is my pleasure this week to have on the podcast uh, with me uh, someone that I've known and admired for a long, long time, uh, Dr. Shoshana Grossbard. Uh, But I don't know if I've pronounced your name right, Shoshana. Am I saying it correctly? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Okay. Well, I've said your name, but uh, could you, for the sake of the listener, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your name? your like any kind of title that you would sort of be uh, known to, uh, that that you would sort of, you know, associate yourself with anything, institutions or anything that you work for? Yeah, well, I'm Shoshana Grossbard and I've been associated with San Diego State University for more than 40 years. And I immigrated to the United States 50 years ago. It's just been my 50th anniversary hmm. oh wow okay great well uh and you're and and you're you were in the economics department you've been in the economics department at san diego state i'm still at the economics department still at the economics department and, and you're at ed- my official title is you know researcher i don't know it doesn't matter i mean i'm retired from teaching on a regular basis yeah but i i just taught a course last semester i'm still active in teaching yeah um, I teach sometimes in other universities and I certainly very busy professionally. I'm not retired and in any shape or form. Yeah. Great. Cool. Well, before we get into your career and your, uh, some of the research topics, um, could you tell me a little bit about growing up? You said you immigrated, uh, 50 years ago. Where did you grow up or where, where were you from originally? So I'm originally from Antwerp, Belgium. Oh, and my parent, my mother was born there. My parents grew up there and I was born there. And I stayed there until age 19. Then mm. I immigrated to Israel and I lived in Israel for five years. Then I came here to get a PhD with the intention of going back to Israel. Mm. So a lot of people think that I'm Israeli, but, and I am, but I'm mostly Belgian in terms of the you know what marked me growing up oh okay what marked you growing up but that, that's an interesting way of putting it what 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 is it about what what does that mean in your in your life being marked by belgium 
Well, um, first of all, the thing that has the, had the most impact on my life is the fact that my parents survived the Holocaust. Uh, my family is Jewish, I'm Jewish. Mm. And my two grandmothers were gassed in Auschwitz. They were shipped from Belgium to, they were born in Poland, they immigrated to Belgium um, at the beginning of the 20th century. And then in 1942, or, they were uh, put on a train to, to Auschwitz and gassed. And mm. from an early age, I learned about that. My mother told me, oh, you know, they just went into showers and they thought they were going to get a shower and then they were killed with gas. You know, I, I think I was made at the most four years old when I found out. Mm. So th this really marked me. Um, the whole experience of my parents having s barely survived, my father having... Um, jumped. That was one of my favorite stories. I would ask, Papi, Papi, tell me the story of how you jumped off the train that was going to take you to, you know, to Poland and kill you. He was on a train going to a, to a death a camp. Train. He was in France. My parents were hiding in France during the war and um, he oh, barely escaped. He said, I almost became a piece of soap, we would say. Oh my gosh. How old was he? Um, when he jumped, he was approximately 30 years old. Was he with any other family members when he jumped on no, the train? he was a prisoner and he, he jumped with another prisoner whose identity I never found out. He, they didn't keep in touch. Oh my gosh. Was that planned? Was that a planned escape? Did they have like a, or did they just see an no, opportunity? No, that's what I always admired about my father that even though he was not athletic, but the train was stationed in at the last station in France before the train was gonna get into Switzerland. Oh, gosh. Um, and at that point, the you know, when you decide this is my last chance to get off. Oh, dear luckily, God. it was one of the first trains that took Jews to concentration camps from France, and they did not lock it from the outside because oh my gosh, you're kidding me. At a later stage, they they they, they it would be impossible to jump. I, I bet but they were, were they do, do you think they were keeping good records of the number of prisoners that got on the train and then the number that got off? Probably the, the Germans were very efficient. This was organized by the Germans. Yeah. So they know they efficient. know they've got a market design problem. They know that they've they've got to start changing some of their practices because they're losing prisoners. Like right. escapes. Oh my gosh. Can I, I did not know that Shoshana about you. Uh, how did your father and your mother meet? So my mother, my, my parents got married in the middle of the war in 1942 in Antwerp, Belgium. Mm -hmm. and their honeymoon was to go on an escape with my father's family. And the plan was for them to get to Switzerland, which was neutral. Mm. So they could, you know, if they had a way to get to Switzerland, they could survive the war. Mm -hmm. And so that was the plan. And my father got caught by the French police because he wasn't listening to the instructions. It was they had hired somebody called un passeur, somebody whose job was to help people, you know, go from one part of the train to the other part of the train to avoid control. And uh, he just wasn't there. And so they caught him. And and then he was in a prison camp, first in France, in the Pyrenees, a place, a place called Gurs, uh, which I think is in Basque country, but I'm not 100% sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyways, he was there for a little while until they decided to ship the Jews to Poland, probably Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, my mother was with a friend in, in Nice, France in the south of France and waited for my father and the, the, there was this additional stories that you know it would take the whole session if I told you all yeah. the stories but they had my parents had a very interesting life and they barely escaped and and survived mm. so you grew up in Belgium because that's where they immigrated after their escape they were originally from Germany no. no, no, no. My mother was born in Belgium. Belgium. Her okay. parents 
Her parents, I never met any of my grandparents, her parents immigrated from Poland. All my grandparents were from the same part of Poland around Krakow and Tarnow. And um, so genetically, I'm 100% Polish Ashkenazi Jew. Mm. But um, my 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 mother's parents immigrated before World War One, so she was born there. Yeah. And in Belgium, and my father and his family immigrated in 1925, and so he grew up first in Poland, and then he came to Belgium. But mm-hmm. they they met in Belgium, they got married in Belgium, and then they escaped with the intention of getting to Switzerland, but they never made it to Switzerland, and they survived in Nice or at the border with Italy. Mm. Um. Uh. I am just didn't know any of that. That's so. So what was it like? What what was it like as a kid growing up in Belgium? What was what's what what year would that have been going from like zero to 10? I was born in the shadow of the Holocaust. I was born in 1948. Mm. My parents returned from hiding in 45. They first lost a child and that was also a tragedy. So uh, my mother returned pregnant, advanced pregnancy, and the child was born and then they lost the child. And I was born in the shadow of a double tragedy. First, they lost their parents and their brothers, and then they lost a child. And finally, I was born, but they were really worn out and they were older. They were my father was 36, my mother was 33, and they had gone through so much and they didn't have much patience for a little child. Mm. And they, I was the only child there. So. They didn't have much patience for a, a, an only, what do you mean? Yeah, they, they were worn out. They had gone oh. through so much. The moment they, were, they were both uh, facing various types of depression. Mm. And, uh, you know, they, they were... But they were very close to their family. There was an extended family there. So mm. and these relatives had suffered less because they got to Switzerland. Mm. So they came back and they were, you know, they were kind of cheerful. And, you know, they also lost a lot. I mean, on my father's side, my grandmother was one of 11 kids. And the seven who stayed in Poland were all killed. And... My grandmother was killed from Belgium, but her three brothers survived in Switzerland. Mm. Then they came back. So my great uncles were a big part of my childhood and mm. it wasn't all bad. Wow. <laughs> but it was wow. challenging for a little girl to have to go through all this. And also what happened is that most Jewish kids in Antwerp had the same story. There's not a single... Jewish child who grew up in Antwerp during that period who didn't have major losses in their family. And some of them had the worst, you know, I thought I was relatively lucky because my my parents wouldn't scream at night from having nightmares and stuff. Mm, They would. They still had, it was probably like. I had a very good friend whose mother had been in Auschwitz and escaped, somehow survived, and she screamed every night. Oh, goodness. So I'm sure, I mean, it's obvious, but you know, we would call it now post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm sure it was just rampant. Yeah. Uh, did they move with you to Israel? Did you say that? I, I missed that part. No, not at all. You went by um, yourself. I went by myself. Uh, the, it was after the six day war when Israel uh, had, had, uh, you know, a war was, uh, the, uh, many many Arab countries and yeah uh, and so uh, I I um, I I was a very attached to Israel already as as an adolescent it was a, being part of a Zionist youth group was a big part of my my childhood mm. Mm. yeah so I I bet you I can only imagine I mean I, is is it what's it like as a young person living in the shadow of the Holocaust with like your immediate family having been murdered and they were murdered as a part of a collective murdering campaign to, to go to a place like Israel where that was a probably a common story at the time everywhere. What was that like as a young person for you? So, um, 
you know, growing up in Antwerp, my my father was somewhat of a Zionist. He was attached to Israel. He had grown up in Poland and over there. It was very common. The Jews were persecuted in Poland as well before the war. And he, you know, there, there was a numerous clauses that, by the way, affected Jacob Mincer as well. Really? So I, I felt very close to Jacob Mincer later on in my life because he really reminded me of my father. Mm. He had a similar handwriting. My father left Poland in 1925, mm. and he was 12 years old. Jacob Mincer left Poland in when he was 17 years old. It's not so different. So they, they really had their elementary school education in, in Poland, in Polish school with Polish language. My father was perfectly fluent in Polish, but I never learned the language because... Uh, my mother didn't know a word of Polish. She's uh, Belgian, you know. Yeah, yeah. Was he your father's age? Was Jacob Mincer your father's age? Yeah, not close enough. You know, my father yeah. was born in 1912, and Jacob Mincer was born 10 years later. I see. 1922. Okay. So it's the same generation. So what are you doing in Israel for those five years? You're in college? Yeah, that's what I had started college in Brussels at the Free University of Brussels, ULB in French. Mm. And then um, I switched to Hebrew University, and that wow. had actually a big impact on my career. I had no idea. I was majoring in economics in Brussels, and then I continued to major in economics at, at Hebrew University. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I just one because I'm a Zionist. I don't. I'm tired of Europe. I don't want. You know. I want to mm. live in Israel, and I have a lot. I had a lot of friends who did the same thing, and so I didn't think this is going to affect my career as an economist. But yeah. actually, it did, and I'll be happy to talk about that. Well, so you were majoring in economics back in Antwerp. What made you? What made? What? What drew you to economics back there? Before we get into Hebrew. Okay, so it was by elimination because uh -huh. actually, um, you know, in in I had an excellent high school education, and uh, in Antwerp, uh, in in Dutch, a place called Koninklijk Lyceum Vomeshus, which mm. means Royal uh, High School for Girls, and it was public school and. Uh, I loved the humanities. Now, they didn't give us a lot of choices. It was either math, Latin math, Latin science, or Latin Greek. So I wasn't interested at that time in science mm. or math. And so I took Latin Greek and I studied a lot of languages and history and, you know, I was going in that direction and I love theater and French literature and you know I was not on the road to become an economist but then I be I decided around age 15 I'm going to leave in Israel I'm not going to live here and I heard that they didn't need a lot of French teachers in Israel that they were already saturated with high school French teachers so I thought to myself, what am I going to do? I can't just be in literature and stuff like that. So, yeah. so I, I decided on a social science. I wasn't ready to become a, a, you know, a, a biologist or a chemist or any of that. I didn't have the training by the time I was finishing high school. So by elimination, I got to, to economics. Mm. And that's... Do you remember, were, were there any... Uh professors at Antwerp that, you know, people would would know about? They were active researchers or economists that we would know about or that well, I would have heard of? At the time, there was barely a university in Antwerp. I went to university in Brussels. Ah, which, Brussels, you know, okay. Which is a short train ride. And um, no, the, the, I mean, there were not too many famous economists at this university. Okay. The top university in Belgium until now is the Catholic University in Leuven. Mm, okay. So then you go to Hebrew and you take your first economics class. What are you, a freshman or do you transfer credits or what, what happens? 
Well, in the first year in Brussels, they didn't even teach us economics. We thought we learned math and statistics and all kinds of things. So I had to take introductory economics. And from the point of view of my later career, it was really a blessing that that the Six Day War broke out and I switched from studying in Belgium to studying in Israel because there were opportunities to do so as a foreign student. And um, and I got fantastic teachers. Uh, my first year, my principal teacher was Yoram Ben Porat. You probably have heard of him if, if since, well, he, he is still considered a well-known labor and household economist. He mm. important. He, he was in the tradition of Becker Mincer economics. Oh. But he was trained at Harvard. Oh, okay. And okay. Yeah, Ben Porat. It's a well-known. He was more like a theorist, and uh, so he was an excellent teacher. And he was, and then um, the whole department of economics at Hebrew University had been built by Don Patenkin, mm. was one of the top students of Milton Friedman. He was mm. from Chicago. He had grown up in Chicago, and then he went to University of Chicago. And because he was already well-known and and uh, very, he had taught at Chicago part of the time. So he built the Department of Economics at Hebrew U on the basis of Chicago. Oh, interesting. And it was a very, I mean, the whole world in those days, I don't know if there were many such departments. Mm. Maybe so it, it was, was like great. a clone. It was like a clone of Chicago. It was because you even said this other person was in the, was a labor economist in the Baker, Becker Mincer. Was he from Columbia? No, no. Joram Ben Porat, I'm pretty sure, got his degree at Harvard. Oh, at Harvard. Oh, okay. okay. But he, did become close to Becker and Mincer in mm. intellectually, and he might have spent some time in New York at Columbia. I'm not sure. Was Milton Friedman ever, did you ever see him uh, at Hebrew, like as a visitor or anything like that? No, Milton Friedman was not much of a Zionist. He was not, he, he, he I don't know if he even had visited Israel by that point. Mm. Uh, at a later point, when Israel and many other countries struggled with inflation, yeah, so, he would go over there and help them. So did the United States yeah. in the in the nineteen seventies and eighties. Mm. Um, then he came to Israel to give advice. I see. I see. What about Becker? Was Becker over there when you were there? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know exactly how attached Becker was to Israel. Mm. He was Jewish also. Um, the, he, he definitely had a tendency to uh, take Israeli students. So during mm. his time at Columbia, quite a few, proportionately, a high percentage of his PhD students were Israeli. I see. Um, and I don't know if it was more so than at Columbia in general. I haven't looked that up, but I have learned in the last decades that I've been studying the history of Becker and Mincer and their as economists at at Columbia and then Becker at Chicago. Uh, in terms of attachment to Israel, Jacob Mincer was a big Zionist. He was very mm. attached to Israel. He, his grandparents, one set of his of grandparents of Jacob survived the war. And I think in the far east in of Russia, of the Soviet Union. And then they got to Israel and he got to visit his grandparents at some point in the 1950s, I think. Mm. He got to see his granddad. So his whole family had been killed in the Holocaust. Um, his parents, his two sisters, and probably, you know, many more relatives. Mm. But he still had his grandparents who survived in Israel. And I don't know if he had become a Zionist 
in Poland before the war, it's very likely, because he knew Hebrew, he had studied Hebrew, uh, he had studied some Hebrew in, in Poland. Um, and, you know, it was very common for Jewish people in Poland before World War II to, to be attached to Israel. And if there had been a way to immigrate to Israel in those years, in the 1930s, probably hundreds of thousands of Jews would have left Poland to go to Israel, but there was no way to do so. Mm. So um, he he ended up being in labor camps and barely surviving the war. And he has actually written about his experience in the Holocaust. And he was very attached to Israel, Jacob Minzer. So he um, he took a special con link and uh, he he took a special uh, approach to to Israeli students. Mm. He took a special yeah. approach. He just was yeah. more he took what, what, them what, under his wings. Like uh, he, he he had a very close connection. For example, with Ruva and Gronau, mm. who I think you, you know pretty well in terms yeah. of his work, mm -hmm. because he's also an econometrician, and he was a student of both Becker and Mincer, mm. and he was very close to Mincer. He continued. Mm to stick when, until uh, Flora Mincer, the widow of Jacob, died and became pretty incapacitated towards the end of her life. She had Alzheimer. Mm. Reuven Grona would visit, stay with her, even after Jacob died. Mm. Oh, wow. So, so can you tell me um, what your first memory is of really being uh impressed or even amazed by economics okay very good question um first of all after i arrived in jerusalem it became clear to me i had no idea you know being a first year student in brussels I had no idea that the Hebrew University in Jerusalem was such a special place for economics. Yeah. But once I arrived there, it became obvious to me and pe the pe students would say, oh, you know, the, the textbook was by Don Patenkin. It had been translated to Hebrew. So mm -hmm. I, I didn't know Hebrew very well. I had to learn Hebrew just to read Introduction to Economics by Don Patenkin. That mm -hmm. was the textbook. Everything was built around it. Mm -hmm. And it became clear to me that, that this is, I'm very lucky to have landed in this, you know, great place. And and uh, many of the students who graduated, the best, the best students went on for PhDs at Chicago, uh, Columbia, and at Harvard. Mm -hmm. so, you mm -hmm. know, that was like, I was blown up, blown away by this. Yeah, yeah. So that that's the first thing, and this and plus, I mean, there were terrific teachers. Mm. They were excellent. One and one of the outstanding teaching teachers was Eitan Shishinsky, mm. uh, who is a price price theory guy, mm. and there were a few more. And I took the masters as well. But the teacher I liked the most during my five years at Jerusalem was Simon Kuznets. Who oh. came to visit uh, Hebrew University to give his last class. He was in his 80s already. Oh. He had retired from Harvard. And he gave us a class on population and economic growth. It was, you know, a great class. And I felt very privileged to be able to take that class. Wow. It was yeah. So when did you decide you wanted to be an economist? Um, I had already by that point, first of all, I had majored in economics. So I became an economist, obviously, but then I decided to continue my graduate students' studies. And I, I double majored in, in economics and sociology at Hebrew University. You had to double major. It was a requirement. Oh. And since I was very drawn to sociology already as a teenager, I took those two. And then for the masters, I really hesitated. Should I continue in economics or in sociology? And 
I decided economics, but I kept a real interest in 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 sociology, especially anthropol social anthropology. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see. Did you think about doing a PhD in sociology then, or even anthropology? I, 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 yeah, I even took some classes in master's classes in sociology while I do I was doing the master in economics. Mm. I had a, some kind of a minor in sociology. Mm, but you didn't think about applying to graduate uh, doctoral program for sociology? No, no. By then, by the time I was in my second year of of the master's in Jerusalem, I was clearly going to go on in economics. I see. Okay. So where'd you apply? So th then it's like another twist that I I really liked Israel. I had, you know, wanted to live there my whole childhood i mean starting at age 12 maybe yeah and i didn't intend to come to the united states but yeah. at the time i was married to my first husband who was also an immigrant um and he didn't want to serve in the israeli army and after five years in israel he would have had to serve and he said let's go to america so he was his idea so you would have stayed, if you had stayed in Israel and gotten your doctorate, would it have been at Hebrew, probably? I don't know a lot about the PhD programs in Israel. Yeah, I guess I would have come to, at the time, I was very committed to living in Jerusalem. I would have probably continued at Hebrew University. Yeah. Okay. So you think, okay, so now we're going to go to America. So now you're, so yeah, keep, so keep going. Sorry. Right. So then um, we applied. Uh, he was in political science and international relations, me in economics. We applied to maybe seven universities, including Columbia and Chicago. Mm. And we both got accepted at both. Mm. And uh, I think at Columbia, I had some more financial help than I was getting at Chicago. I got mm. so much Chicago, but not much. Mm. But um, I really wanted to go to Chicago. Uh, you did. And that was because so of your experiences. That's why we did. That was because of your experiences at Hebrew with some of these professors, or was no, it? Right then, this is now the year 1972. Ah. By then, Becker had left Columbia in '69, so. Um, so you were thinking he, about Becker. You you were kind of wanting to go where Becker was. Not really. I was oh. not that into Becker at the time, but in part because Becker had left and there had been uh, in 68, Becker left in part because of the student um, revolution in the United States and Columbia was uh, one of the prominent departments of economics where students um, tried to overtake the uh, not just economics, but the whole university. The I didn't Columbia. know that. That Becker Becker's reasoning for leaving Columbia was part one connected. of the reasons. Wow, he was, that he was very upset that the university had taken the side of students, and they were, you know, on the they're still very left wing Columbia. You know, yeah. they were that way in '68 as well, and Jacob and 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 Gary were very upset about that. Oh, and wow. Winter also considered leaving New York for that reason. And he, he was offered a job at, at Chicago. And he decided it, to stay. He decided to stay mostly because his wife, Flora Mincer, was a prominent oncologist, a radiologist. And he was, she was a medical doctor. I see. And, and she didn't want to move. Mm, wow. I have never heard that factoid. I never, uh, I just kind of thought, oh yeah, I just wanted to go back home to Chicago, but that's not really what it was. It was, it was. He wasn't more... home. He, he had grown up in, first in Pennsylvania and then in Brooklyn. Right. And actually. I thought he grew up wife, in Indiana. He grew up in Pennsylvania. He was born and raised in Pennsylvania. I forgot the name of the town. Oh. Small town, Allentown maybe. Okay. I actually thought it was Gary, Indiana, but that's probably because his name is Gary. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay good i'm learning lots of new things all right so uh so yeah so he goes back so how so you get to chicago in 72 wait so you apply to a few places you apply to a few places did you right. apply to a few schools and, and, and I, I was accepted at columbia in chicago and i 
chose Chicago because by then it was clearly a better department. Mm. Uh, you know, they, they had, and I had studied at Jerusalem with Don Potemkin, who was still yeah. constantly going to Chicago. And there were Chicago people visiting, mostly people probably macro and monetary economics, but you know, I was not particularly interested. I don't even remember their names. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure Potemkin was at the time a very well-known economist. Chicago was internationally renowned as a phenomenal economics department in 1972, the way they are right now, or even more so or less so. Or, or... Many people think that that was like the golden age because, you know, you had an amazing faculty there at the time. Mm, mm. So Milton you get... Friedman was still in residence. Mil when I took Milton Friedman's class in the first quarter at Chicago in the yeah. fall of 72, yeah. it was the last time he taught price theory. Because How old he was had he? a massive heart attack. He had a massive heart attack? Oh, I didn't and know he that. Was born, I think he was born in 1911. So he was only 61 years old. Goodness. Oh, wow. He lived for a while longer, though. He passed away in the 80s. Much longer. Yeah, much longer. But he he he, he continued to be at Chicago for a while. Yeah. But he wasn't teaching this huge class. We had like, you know, there were many undergraduates taking the class. It was a huge class. And so he was teaching price theory. He was teaching price theory and you took it from him. You didn't take you didn't take Becker's famous price theory class. You took, I also took you Becker's. It was in the first quarter. You could take either Milton Friedman when I started in the yeah. fall of 72. You could take either uh, Milton Friedman or Don McCluskey, who became J. Dre McCluskey. Oh, wow. So McCluskey was taking the students who had to catch up because, you know, I, I had gotten fantastic scores on my GRE in economics because I had been trained for five years at a Chicago. Oh, uh, yeah, right, right. Kursal, you know, it was like, so I I, I was really prepared for, mm. for Chicago. But then McCloskey would take, because because Chicago had a reputation uh, of taking a larger variance of incoming students, and then they exactly. would sort of see who would make it. Exactly. So right. that, I was also lucky in that respect, because be, in part because I had been an immigrant to Israel, my grades were not so fantastic in the beginning. Right. And um, so I was still able to get to Chicago because they had, they would take a lot of students and yeah. they really, Greg Lewis was in charge of admissions. Oh, wow. Really? And he really liked Israeli students. Mm. We were three people from Jerusalem who, in the entering class. Wow. At Chicago. So who's was, in your class? There were no other three students from any other university. Oh, wow. There so were so who, Princeton. Who were some of the classmates that, that uh, you know, were, were, were sort of sorted into academia that, that people might have known of that were in your, your cohort? Sanford Grossman, Sandy Grossman, oh. was in my, my class with Milton Friedman. He was at the time... He was just an undergraduate. He was probably just 19, <laughs> but because he was doing the BA and the PhD together. Oh, they did. They, have a, they had a BA PhD. They had that. Yeah. There were <laughs> wow. a, few, a few of these really brilliant young guys yeah. uh, who, who were doing both BA and PhD. Right. So he was in there. Anybody else? Were you the only female in your cohort? Not the only, but one of the only. Uh, approximately 70 students started that year and yeah. there were approximately five or six women five or six women okay um how many people and many of them didn't finish they don't finish right that's the that was the chicago production function was right. take a and large that, group and then let then see who makes it to the second stage like a tournament right so the with, of the women who started with me, I think only two of us finished. Ah, uh, who was me, the other me, female? Me and India, Indira. So it was some Indian ladies who who never became very famous, and she also studied with Becker. Oh, okay. So Kulkarni, I think her last name was Kulkarni. 
Cook County. Okay. So, uh, so how many years were you there? From 72 I was, to... I was in residence for four years. Oh, which four years. Which included um, the whole... After one quarter, I did well, and I started getting a, a scholarship. But because I was a foreign student, I didn't qualify for certain scholarships. Mm. And I my scholarship was basically an opportunity to be the a research assistant for T.W. Schultz. Oh, really? Who was a fantastic man. Oh, wow. I was very lucky. And then after the, in my, for my third and fourth year, I qualified uh, for the Sloan Scholarship. Becker oh. chose me as one of the recipients of a Sloan Scholarship that he could give to stu his students. Yeah. And so you got that. I got that. That's I don't great. Know who else got it, but. I, I was one of the ones, okay. maybe two or three who got that. Okay. So so tell me about those four years. Are you very rapidly sort of realizing, yeah, I want to work? Like, what what is it like at Chicago? You you are going to say, doc, knock, 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 Dr. Becker, will you be my advisor? Or is it that you're just working and is it's just kind of organic who becomes your advisor? Can you describe it to somebody that's never been there? So first of all, you know, it was like a wonderland for economists. I mean, it was just amazing. Every professor was brilliant. And, you know, like my whole first year, I, I had Stanley Fisher from macroeconomics. I had Bob Barrow for the second segment of, of, of macroeconomics. Wow. Um, then in you know winter and spring, it was Gary Becker teaching two two quarters of his famous price theory class, and we were using a textbook that he wrote and that Michael Grossman and 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 Bob Michael had edited. Uh, you know the, that by the time I I I was in the middle of my first quarter in the in the fall, I had changed um direction because in israel i had been i started writing a dissertation a master thesis about educate economics of education mm. and um and i was taking a class by mary jane bauman at in the education department at chicago mm. and it didn't interest me at all i she was not interesting to me and I decided not to continue in education after a few weeks. Mm -hmm. And by then I had, you know, heard about Gary Becker. I had not yet taken any of his classes, but by the time I took his first class in the winter of 73, that was it. I said, I want to take, I want to have Gary Becker as my advisor. What what about Dr. Becker was so what, what do you what do you what was it about him that did that that you know other faculty didn't have quite that because you're around all these brilliant people so what is it about Dr. Becker that's impacting you so much so, so he had a charismatic personality hmm. and he um, at that time he was about forty two years old okay. Hmm young, he was energetic, and he chose to teach the class. You know, remember, there's like more than 70 students in that class. Mm. Everybody's going to try to pass the core exam at the end of the, of, the, of the spring, okay? So you have this huge class, and uh, he wanted us to be in an auditorium where he could make eye contact with every student. So, so we would cross the midway to the law school mm -hmm. and sit there and he could see everybody. And uh, he would ask you direct questions. You already heard some of that from Michael. Bob Michael was telling you about how, yeah. you know, how intimidating it was. But because I had already gone through so much with my parents and moving to Israel and moving to Chicago, I was not intimidated. Mm. And I would often respond when he asked questions. And so, you know, he, he liked to interact with me and I had fun with that. And um, I was really uh, enchanted that this, you know, brilliant teacher and he likes me and yeah, I thought he liked me. Yeah, 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 yeah.
So was he actively at that time? This was like mid seventies. So he's working on family topics. Yes. Yes. He actually, that's the same year that the theory of marriage came out mm. and we had to study that article. Is and that so I, often, I went, is that co-authored with, is it a part one and a part two that's co-authored with someone? Am I thinking of something different? No, no. The theory of marriage is a soul is so solely authored by Becker, both parts. Part one is published in 73, yeah. part two is published it in It is a part one, part two, okay. They're both in the JPE, and they, Becker is the sole author. Mm. And uh, Mincer never really went that way. First of all, they never co-authored anything. Yeah. Which is one of the reasons that people are forgetting Mincer. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a tragedy. I'm very upset about it. And I mm. was so happy it was... Bob Michael's interview with you because through the interview he kept asking Becker Becker and he kept at a number kept saying of about Mincer a couple yeah. of times he said this is not just Becker it's Mincer yeah yeah so, so by the time Becker moves to Chicago Mincer is getting less attention and why and in part uh, Becker writes these articles on marriage which Beck with Mincer was not involved in and and he never got that far into that direction yeah yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so he's right. Yeah. I think I was thinking of, I, think I, I have such a horrible memory. I'm thinking of Elizabeth. Oh gosh. Oh, Landis, Landis. Yes. Elizabeth Landis has a co-authored paper on the family divorce. Maybe is it three yeah, people? That's, that's 1977. Like... That's Becker, Michael and, and oh, that's Becker, Bob. Landis, Michael. Oh, that's, that's 1977. Glad, now, glad now, I did that Lisa on his interview. Lisa Landis interviews. completed her PhD at Columbia. Right. Okay, so very from the point of view of the history of economics of the household and uh, what for a while was called the new home, home yeah. economics, mm -hmm. and, and I prefer the term modern household economics, but, you know, the, uh, what that, that was started at Columbia by... Mincer and Becker. I'm pretty, uh, you know, it's it's very hard to. You, you to see, you exactly see the right. You see the it. the economics of the family slash uh, modern labor, modern labor, or that as kind of being at Columbia, and and, and, and continuing modern, at modern Chicago. labor, modern labor. I would say, and I think Jim Heckman supports that. I just recently had a conversation with him in London. Mm. I would say the fathers, and I think this is in writing. If you really want to see it, I can find it. It's not by Heckman, but by Mincer himself. The fathers of modern labor economics are, first of all, Greg Lewis, mm. and then Becker and Mincer. Oh. Okay, that's the th the fathers of modern labor economics. Then you go to household economics. Now that in that includes human capital, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, even though B Greg Lewis never did that much on human capital, mm. but both Mincer and Becker did a lot on human capital. Jacob Mincer's thesis is on human capital. Mm. That makes a human capital. Okay, so now you have another type of work that develops at Columbia in the 1960s, and that's what I now call, and many others call, household economics, and it yeah. can be called modern household economics because it's really different from home economics and whatever was done in, in, in Chicago and other places by home economists like Margaret Reed. Okay, right. So you have, you have the household becoming the, the, the key agent uh, in economic models that are connected to labor economics. Mm. And I, in my opinion, the number one force there is Jacob Mincer. But since Jacob Mincer doesn't publish theoretical pieces in top journals about it, but he just publishes two articles in uh, volumes of that that uh, didn't have that much impact. Okay, but they precede Becker's 
theory uh, of allocation of time. Yeah. And every single theme that Becker touches upon in the 65 article on theory of allocation of time is already covered by Jacob Mincer in his 1963 article on opportunity cost. Mm. So, but he doesn't have any, you know, production function and right. the maximization, which today is not really thought of as so crucial that you should right. have a, you know, maximization model. So, you know, Mincer would go directly to the econometrics. Mm. He had the idea of looking at labor force participation of women and fertility and, and consumption and transportation. All those themes are already in Mincer's 1963 article on opportunity costs. And, and people forget that because all they know is Becker. And Becker did a lot to make people forget Mincer. I, I don't know how purposefully it, he did it. Um, it might have been just his habit of aggrandizing himself with respect to everybody. Mm. Or did they ever have a falling out? No, they loved each other. Oh, they did. Mincer, Mincer having been a Holocaust survivor, mm. starting his education after he had been in DP camps, survived, somehow made it some nice officer from the U.S. Army, took a liking to this young man who knew English and translated for him and arranged for him to get a scholarship at um, Emory University in Atlanta. Mm. Mentor went to Emory? Yeah. Oh, wow. At age 26, 27, he was, you know, he had survived the Holocaust. He started, the Holocaust started when he was, he, he had moved to Czech, Czechoslovakia huh. and the, the Germans invaded in 38. He was 17 years old. Huh. So you devoted your whole career, you know, to building up uh, the economics of the family, you know, in a lot of ways, both through your own scholarship, but also as a, an editor. And so I'm curious about the origins of your journal, Review of Economics of the Household. Can you can you tell me why that journal got started? Why was it what was what was why wasn't Journal of Labor Economics or Journal of Human Resources? That, you know, why wasn't that enough? What 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 was missing in the in academia? Very good question. I'm very happy to respond to that. So um after I graduated and wrote my dissertation under Barry Becker with participation. Jim Heckman served on my committee. Mm. Ed Lazier ser served on my committee. Oh, wow. I, I had access to Greg Lewis and he, he, I took his labor economics classes, which influenced my, my, my analytical skills. Um, you know, I had a fantastic education and I'm writing an innovative thesis on polygamy, which was a, a subject covered by Becker in his article in the JPE. T.W. Schultz, who gets the Nobel Prize first of all these professors I took, um, you know, it, it was in 1979. I was already finished. I got my degree in 78. But, you know, T.W. Schultz was a big light. He was a luminary, yeah, a Nobel Prize second Nobel Prize from Chicago after Milton Friedman, you know, and he had encouraged me to do this dissertation. He had found the data for me. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I I think, I, you know, when I left Chicago, I thought I was like a star. I was mm. going to be a star, you know. Mm. And it was not at all like that. I, I had a ter terrible time finding a, any job for all kinds of reasons, but, you know, I won't delve into that. But, you know, I, I even though I spent a year at Stanford, at the Center for Advanced Study early on in my career, 1980 to 81, I got two top publications in 84 and 88 in the JPE and the Economic Journal. You know, I, I, I felt very, very confident that, uh, you know, I'm going to make it as an econ as a well-known or well-established economist in a good university with PhD students, you know, that, that I took that for granted. Right. It didn't happen. Mm. It didn't happen. And I, 
you know, I was, I kept thinking, what is missing? I got the top professors, I got, you know, I got publications in top journals. Oh, maybe I'll write a book. So I write The Economics of Marriage as a book. And, you know, so far it has almost 500 citations. That's not too bad. But, mm -hmm. you know, that's always over a long period of time because I published it in 93. So I thought a book, you know, that's going to make a difference. Now yeah. I'm going to get an offer somewhere in a, you know, good university with PhD students. Yeah. Nothing happens. Okay. So then I. What were you thinking? What were you? What were you thinking would be a likely outcome? Just so that I can kind of reference it from what you thought might happen to what did happen. What 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 kind of things were you thinking? This is a natural trajectory, and that it would look like. I don't know exactly. You know, like there's all kinds of other factors involved, but I, you know, it's been frustrating for me my whole career that I have not been associated with a university that has a PhD in economics. Right. That's, you know, that's a big must if you want to have an impact. Mm -hmm. You must have PhD students going to work under you. Right. So right. that's that's been a big factor. Yeah. And that, you know, not more concrete than that. Mm -hmm. And all the people who studied with me who were not necessarily getting, you know, I was among the top students in terms of my grades at Chicago. You know, like they they graded you out, out of these 70 people that everybody practically took the core exam. And then they would come up with who are the top 10 students. I was among them. Yeah. So, and the other labor economists, uh, some of them were there too, but some were not. Yeah. But they landed PhD, uh, you know, in PhD granting institutions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I started scratching my head. What happened? Hmm. You know, how come I've done all the things you're supposed to do, and I still refuse to. To, to say, oh, I was discriminated against because I'm a woman. I don't, I, I don't, I mean, it's possible. It's very possible. Mm. It's hard to prove. And I'm not going to use that as an excuse. Okay. So here I am. I've, I've, by, 90, by the 90s, my book comes out in 93. Mm. And, you know, by then I've tried everything that, that you're supposed to do to land a job in a, top university and have uh, a, a good reputation, okay? It's being considered what they call a good economist. That's what they would say at Chicago. Oh, know, really? Economist. He's that's a good economist. Big, that's the great greatest compliment you could get. Okay, yeah. so yeah. nobody's saying that about me. Yeah. And I'm frustrated. And um, so I started studying what happens when Becker moved from Columbia to Chicago? Because look, all these people who studied at Columbia, they did so well. Bill Landis um, gets to the law school at Chicago. Uh, Bob Michael, first he's at Stanford, then he comes to Chicago. Um, Michael Grossman is directing the the health economics at NBR from the time he graduates practically. Right. Um, you know, uh, and the list is long. There's Saul Palachek and, and Ruven Gronau and Isaac Ehrlich, and you have a whole list of people who did great in their career as economists. Right. And then it's not just me at Chicago who's going nowhere. There's Michael Keeley. You never heard of him. He was a top student. He's, he's my age, but he started two years earlier because he didn't go get a master's at Hebrew University. Or any other. He went directly from BA to PhD. So he also studied with Gary Becker. He did a, a very nice dissertation on age at marriage. And that's like the first, includes the first model of search in the marriage market. Wow. Ten years before Mortensen, who eventually got the Nobel Prize for search theory, yeah, Michael Keeley writes a very similar model mm. that's published in Economic Inquiry. 
And nobody talks about Michael Keeley. Michael Keeley doesn't get a top position. He, he gets to Stanford Research Institute, which is, you know, a nice, uh, respectable research institute at the time. But this is nothing mind-blowing like the, stu the students of Jim Heckman who came out a year after us, or so about the same time. And they land, um, McCurdy goes to Stanford and John A. Bout goes to Princeton. Okay, so I'm pretty sure it's Princeton. So, mm -hmm. you know, these are Jim Heckman students who, who are riding the wave of the new labor econometrics. Right. You know, the, the new panel data. Right. The new this, the new that. They get top position, top, top appointments. And the Becker students who, not just Becker, but, you know, students of other professors in labor economics, Nobody is doing great. Mm. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, how come it was so different at Columbia? That became a pressing question to me. And because I was connected personally to Jacob Mincer, who had been, he came for a quarter at Chicago, I think in 75, and I, I took his class which was all about Mincer equations. It was not about household economics, but still, you know, I got exposed to him. I got to talk to him. Then Mincer at two different points invited me to give a talk at Columbia in the, mm. the, the labor workshop. Um, and, uh, you know, so uh, I have, I'm talking to Mincer. I'm talking to other people. I've I become friendly with Andrea Beller early on in, who was a student at Columbia, but she only had Becker for one year, then he left for Chicago, but she knows everybody. And I get to meet a bunch of other people who got their PhD there, including women who be very friendly to me. So I'm starting to um to to figure out this is this is not about me. This is about Becker first being buddy buddy with Jacob Mincer and running the labor workshop with him and then moving to Chicago and entering a different Orbit. This is now Chicago with Milton Friedman, George Stigler. These become the important people in Becker's life. Wow. Wow. That's interesting. This was, this is interesting on a lot of levels, but this was really personal for you. This was also you trying to make sense of your, your, your career. Right. Yeah. How, uh, how has that, so how do you, I guess, how does all that make you feel? It makes me feel like now that 20 years, well, we're talking now, you know, this 93, I, I, I published my book. The journal is born around 2001. So it's almost a decade. The first issue it comes out in 2003. So, you know, it, it, it is thanks to the all this thinking I'm doing about Becker, Mincer, Chicago, Columbia, I and the new home economics has been lost. Where is it uh, in 1990, in, nine, in 2000? Where is the new home economics? It disappeared. When I organized a conference for Jacob Mincer's 80th birthday at Columbia in 2002, mm. 20 years ago, Jim Heckman asked me to organize that conference. How come he didn't ask a Columbia professor to do that? Mm. He does, Jim Heckman doesn't even know anybody teaching or doesn't know very well anyone teaching at Columbia at that point. He calls me or contacts me at San Diego State University and asked me, would you like to organize that? And why did he get to me? Because I had already circulated at that point uh, a manuscript about the new home economics at Columbia and Chicago, which got published in Feminist Economics. Mm. And that's where I first wrote, you know, the new, I wrote a lot of stuff, but I, you know, I wrote among other things, Jacob Mincer deserves more credit. By then, Becker had received his Nobel Prize and Jacob did not get it. And people like Heckman and me who know the history think it's a great injustice. 
Mm. Because even though Becker had many ideas, the idea of economics of the family that became the topic of his treatise is probably the number one idea. And it comes from Mincer. It starts with Mincer. So Sounds it's a terrible justice to, to that Becker, Becker, Becker. Nobody talks about Mincer. It also sounds like Dr. Heckman has been a very supportive person in your career. Am I reading that correctly? Yeah, but not all the time. <laughs> and he did not help me get a job. Sure. Okay. Okay. But he's continuing to to sort of like support you after that. Is that right? Asking you to organize things. He continues to be supportive. And I'm very grateful for that. I'm also very grateful to Gary Becker for whatever he gave me. He gave me yeah. a lot. Right. Okay? right. Right. It didn't end with a job, but it's, you know, it, it gave me a lot. Yeah. And another thing he did not give me, which I'm still a little upset about, but much, much less now, is that... <clears throat> From the time I fin I left Chicago in 76, and I still didn't have my PhD, but I had presented my work on the economics of polygamy in the workshop, in Becker's workshop, yeah. at least once, maybe twice. From that point on, I wrote many other articles, including my economic journal article, which has nothing to do with polygamy or very little. Becker never invited me to present a paper in his workshop. He ran his workshop until he died. Mm. 2014 all these years i tried many times until i gave up i sent him many of my papers i said i think this is a very good paper maybe you would like to invite me to present it he invited uh, many of his former students to give papers how did that feel never invited me so that's another you know, How did that make that, you that feel? That hurt me. That hurt me. But at the same time, you know, he was very nice. Yeah. And, um, and in the case of Heckman, I was able to recently invite him to be the keynote speaker at the CEHO meetings, the Society of Economics of the Household meetings in yeah. London. Yeah. But that's because the lecture was called Jacob Mincer Lecture, because I know how Jacob, how, how Jim <laughs> Heckman, feels about Heck, feels about Mincer about Jacob Mincer being forgotten mm. and the fact that he got this up he was very he, he he was thrilled that he had this opportunity to tell a crowd of young people in household economics how important Jacob Mincer was mm. and he spent almost the whole lecture praising Jacob Mincer mm. this has been such a meaningful conversation i i really appreciate it shoshana i've just have grown over the years to really have a lot of affection and look up to you a lot um i want to end with one question this isn't meant to ask you what your favorite paper in economics is uh i asked something like that to susan athey and she said you're not supposed to talk in terms of superlatives so i'm going to say it differently what's a paper in economics that you have found to sort of reside in your memory and your thought um, a lot. You know, you think about it regularly. Maybe it even surprises you that you've thought about, that you continue to think about it, that it's apparently meant a lot to you. Wow. That's, I find that difficult to answer. I mean... I, because I had such fantastic teachers and I tend to think that when somebody presents material in a classroom or a seminar, it has more impact than when it is in written form. Yeah. I, 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 I can't really think of one article like I, Obviously, I've been very influenced by Becker and Greg Lewis. And um, I would say those are the, Milton Friedman, those are the teachers who really influenced me. I was, uh, I was very mm -hmm. impressed by, by some of the presentations I heard in the law and economics workshop at Chicago. I mean... Ronald Coase was there 
I mean, you you know, you had such brilliant people there, and I, the 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 nostalgia that I carry is the nostalgia for Chicago in the nineteen seventies. That's that's what I carry. Um, oh, I forgot Ed Lazier. I was yeah. so lucky to have Ed Lazier in my career early on. We are, you know, he died unfortunately recently, um, but. We are contemporaries. We both born in 1948. Mm. And he arrived in in a year after I did, and he was already an assistant professor with a PhD from Harvard, studied with Guilicus, and I was just doing my master's, yeah. uh, my PhD. I mean, but we hit it off, and uh, he was wonderful he was yeah. so supportive until the very end always writing me nice emails mm. and, you know i was very lucky to have people like that so so that's why i kept i kept wondering you know what's going on with becker why isn't he more supportive i mean you know here are these other people that are, they're pretty intelligent they're pretty successful you know heckman and lazier and tw jules and and later clive granger and Jack Hirschleifer, I became friendly with in California. You know what's wrong? Nothing is wrong with me. I don't think anything right. is wrong. right. Anyway, that's that's uh, you know. Uh, I, I, there's no article I really go back to. I, I'm more. It sounds I, like I your teach. More. It's it sounds like your the from what I, I can gather it's is the things that really impacted you were your teachers. The the teachers and the people who. I talked to and they supported me and right. helped me develop intellectually. Yeah. And um, I also want to say thank you to Zach Rolnick, who is working as an editor for Kluwer. And he signed me up for the review of economics of the household in 2001. So I'm very grateful to him. He saw, he saw that I have a message to carry about the legacy of of the new home economics from mm. Minster and, and Becker. And, mm. you know, he saw that. Well, thank you so much, Shoshana, for giving me this hour of your time. I really have enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And your questions were very good. I, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to talk about my high school teachers and some <laughs> other <laughs> the questions you asked Bob Michael and, and a few other people. Uh, it, it was wonderful. Well, you have a great day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.